everyone. I'm James Milan. Welcome to this public affairs special program. Um, I am joined today by Professor Robert Bellinger from Suffolk University, and we're here to talk about a really intriguing project as far as I and I think a lot of other people are concerned, uh, which has to do with uh, our neighboring town, uh, Lexington and, and others. Uh, but the famed Lexington in many ways in terms of its role in U.S. history. And uh, we're here to talk about the fact that the professor is going to be uh, in charge of a project conducting research that may, well, it's not going to confound that history or that mythological place that Lexington has, but it will, it will deepen our understanding of what the world was, uh, what the world was like at that time. So first of all, uh, with that rather lengthy introduction, excuse me for not getting to you first, Professor, but uh, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Yeah, we really forward. appreciate it. I was, me too. And I, I have been looking forward to this conversation for a while because your uh, the project garnered some attention, including a, you know, a prominent article in The Globe, happy to say, a couple of months back, um, uh, right around Patriots Day and, and the celebrations that take place there. And there's good reason why they chose that timing to uh, feature this story. So um, I'm going to ask you just to um, very briefly mention the project. Then I'd like to talk to you about your own career trajectory for a little bit, and then we'll del delve more deeply uh, into the research you'll be doing. But if you don't mind, just a, a quick introduction to what this project is. OK. Um... It's a project of the Lexington Historical Society. And what I am tasked with doing is researching the African and African-American history of Lexington um, during slavery, um, during the era of the um, American War of Independence, and into the 19th century. Um, right now, I'm focused on the 17th and 18th century, and um, really, um, trying to get a sense of that broader history to deepen the story that um, is told at the historic sites and for the uh, town in general. Yeah, so uh, one thing I can assume is that the, the results of your research, unlike a certain amount of academic research, which I know um, has a, 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 re a relatively confined audience, here, uh, I think maybe you'll be looking to to uh, to find that your that your work has an impact, a direct impact, on the narrative as it is then passed on uh, to visitors to to Lexington, to Concord, to this area. Uh, is that is that uh, is that accurate? Yes, that that's accurate, and and really this work falls into the um, genre of um, public history. Um, which is um, a recently more recognized field. Um, and in fact, um, at Suffolk University, they have a concentration for history majors in public history. Um, and what public history is, is any history that interfaces directly with the public, which is historic sites, monuments, um, interpretation of those sites and monuments. Um, and so this is a public history project. And what makes it really exciting and um, uh, very special is that there are a number of public historians who have been doing this work over the years and who have come forward to share what they have done with me. And so I have a great foundation to build upon and to compare the notes and the um, conclusions of all of these wonderful um, local and public historians. Uh, we will get back uh, and, and, and focus for much of this conversation on uh, the details uh, of the project. But let me ask you to take a step back first and, and tell us just a little bit about yourself and how you uh, come to be uh, a professor um, at one of our local universities here. And, uh, and not only that, but a historian, clearly, 
Um, is this something that has been present for you as a as an interest or passion for much of your life? Tell tell us a little bit about how you got here. Well, um, I guess I could say it has been a passion for much of my life because I'm old and uh, <laughs> have lived a good portion of my life. Um, but it was not always a passion when I was younger. Um, if we were to um, go back to my high school years um, and someone asked me my feelings about history, a deep passion would not have been part of the response. <laughs> um, it was one of my least favorite subjects. Um, Interesting. And, and part of it was that it seemed to be taught um, in a way that was very distant and which I, I didn't feel connected to um, the stories that were being presented. Um, when I went to college, I got introduced to history again through the discipline of black studies. And it was presenting things I had not heard of before, but also presenting it in ways that were connective, that, um, involved passion, involved, um, and I had a wonderful professor who helped me see how literature and history connected and how these stories were human stories. And so that's how I began to get involved in history. Um, but I still did not think of myself as a historian at that point. I was um, really focused on being an educator, which is really my first passion, um, having been a teacher for more than 40 years um, and having taught all ages from preschool through university. Um, and so that's what I pursued, a master's in education, and then I was teaching. And then somewhere along the line, I decided that I wanted to um, move on from teaching social studies and photography to teaching history. And so I began to work on that and I got a job teaching history um, at a secondary school, a private secondary school, and really spent four years deeply engaged in teaching um, American history. And um, that, then from there, um, I ended up going to Suffolk University as a one year sabbatical replacement. Um, and uh, in the history department. And that one year turned into two years. And now I've just completed 34 years. And um, at the um, end of this month, I will be uh, moving on from Suffolk University. Um, while I was there, I did teach courses in American history, but I also um, was a founder and director of a black studies program which um and director of the clark collection of african-american literature and was also involved in the development of the public history program that they have there um because i've done a lot of work in that area as well so um i think that's how i got to to here <laughs> As I saw this article in the Globe, I was really drawn um, to the project itself. I think it's wonderful. I think I, as uh, you know, I, it, it touches the part of me that I no longer teach history, but I still think like a history teacher. And I think, oh my God, it would be so great to have this additional information to share with our students here. Um, you know, students of color and white students for sure. Um, is simply to be able, again, to, to make sure that that history is the most complete version uh, mm -hmm. that we're able to come up with. As we know, it's hard enough to figure yeah. out what happened, um, yeah. but well, one, stifling one thing voices that, in the process. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, one thing that's really exciting is over the years, I have met many, many dedicated high school um, history teachers like yourself who really have put in a lot and really make their classes interesting. I just was not fortunate to have one of those teachers, um, but there are some amazing um, work being done at the high school level these days in particular. I've been impressed um, by that. 
Yes, and obviously the fact that your own both both your own interest being stoked by, but also uh, the fact that the way to that you were able to connect with a course of study happened for you through Black Studies programs, and then again through the public history program that you yourself have helped to establish there at Suffolk is a, again another indication that kind of history the way it is dominantly presented um, in our American curriculums still, um, you know, we've got a long way to go to, to make sure that that is a, feels like it is something of relevance uh, to more young people. First of all, let me ask you, how is it as a noted local public historian that you came on the radar of whoever it was who conceived of this work to begin with? Was it, in fact, your own conception? Tell us a little bit about where this idea comes from. Um, you know, it's interesting. Often I'm involved in, in projects. And when I think back to how I began to get involved, it, it's a little fuzzy. Um, you know, it's interesting. I know all of this uh, great historical information, but when it comes to my own history, sometimes it's not as clear. Um, but, You're not alone. Um, yeah, but I know that um, I had attended a couple of things that the Lexington Historical Society had um, when they began um, talking about expanding the view of African and African American history in Lexington. And I met folks at the Historical Society and the fact that I am local and I'm a historian, um, I think had a big role to, uh, in, in, me, in me being asked if I would be interested in taking on this position. Um, and I said, sure, I, I thought it was exciting, interesting. I, I had been starting to look at Lexington's history a little more and thought this would be a great opportunity to dig deeper. What kinds of things do you, uh, are you anticipating being able to add um, to the historical narrative as it currently stands? Well, um, what I'm hoping, well, this first part of the research that I'm doing, um, I've been trying to read through what's been written um, and also have started to dive into the archives um, over at um, the Historical Society um, to, because I want to be able to look at the actual documents and what documentation there is as well as what people have made of that. Um, and so um, as, I'm, as, as I am right now, I'm looking to see if there are any gaps there are, um, any questions that are hanging um, that can be filled through the archives, um, and then do more expansive look at other archives in the area um, and, and begin to try to piece together um, family connections, um, identities, um, and as much information about um, both the enslaved and free black populations of Lexington. And, and what's exciting is that that also carries over into neighboring communities because during the 17th and 18th centuries, um, many of these communities were just being formed. So the borders and geography were much more fluid. Um, people moved between them. Um, you might have someone living in Lexington marrying someone in Arlington and um, moving there um, or, you know, shuttling back and forth. But that might affect um, surnames and, and other things. And then you might have children of those unions. So um, it's been exciting because it's also carrying me into um, Arlington or Monotony, um, into Concord, into Lincoln, and really looking at these surrounding communities as well. So it's giving me a a really good sense of this um, era. You know, when um, I, you know, I, I mentioned there was a Boston Globe article. The 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 um, the project itself has garnered some attention, I think, because of that irresistible paradox or irony um, that Lexington, considering to be considered to be one of our bedrocks of freedom and liberty. 
um, had an enslaved population um, even at that at the time in, at which it took that it that prominent place in our history. Um, and I do think that people have latched on to, as I did, that particular aspect of the work that you're doing. But you were just mentioning that um, that there were that you're also going to be looking and 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 fleshing out more the history of the free p black people uh, uh, at that time. Um, how how you know from from what you already know um you know what what um what what, what were the dynamics to the extent that that you can uh, speak to it um between the free black, black populations in this area at that time and their enslaved brethren do you do you have any sense of that um well, I don't have any real specific um, anecdotes, um, but I do know that in some cases um, you might have someone who is free marrying someone who is enslaved. Um, so my um, initial thoughts, um, also based on research done in in slavery and other parts of the um, United States and also um, just in general, the connections were pretty clear. Um, and um, often they bridged family. Um, they definitely were a source of support. Um, and they the, the roles that the free black community played might be multiple. Um, but one thing I do know is that um, they were, I think, part of this larger community. And I'm not sure um, if they engaged in celebrations together or not. Those are some of the things I'm considering as well. Mm -hmm. And as you have already alluded to, a lot of your work is going to be in the archives, both in Lexington and in surrounding communities. Um, Archives are, by definition, uh, kind of storehouses of documents and documentation. So, uh, therefore, literacy uh, pay, plays a, a prominent role in what voices endure over time. Um, uh, do you have you already, and do you expect to find, um, you know, uh, kind of testimonies and memoirs and things like that from, I assume, more likely free black populations because. I uh, assume that there were real inhibitions on uh, those who were enslaved being able to, you know, read and write and pat, kind of record uh, their thoughts and their experience. Well, one of, one of the um, things in looking at literacy during the 17th and 18th and into the 19th century is that um, the overall population had a very small literate um, number. <laughs> Many mm -hmm. people were illiterate for a variety of reasons. Um, so I, um, the enslaved population probably would have less of a chance to do that, to read and write. However, there are, and, and not particularly to this study, but there are um, cases where enslaved people learned how to read and write to help keep records for their um, enslavers. And so um, I, I haven't made any distinctions between the, mm -hmm. uh, about literacy. However, um, from what I know, there aren't any um, um, letters or diaries or testimonials from the enslaved population that are known to exist. Um, and much of what appears in the archives are their names um, and and some times connections um, with family members or to enslavers. Um, and so often in church records, people who are baptized would be there. Tax records, those who are free would be paying taxes. So it's really piecing it together from um, documents and mentions here and there um, and really trying to flesh it out in that way. Yeah, thanks for that insight in, uh, you know, brief as it was into the, you know, what I think 
all of us would acknowledge is the, the grunt work, absolutely essential, uh, but nonetheless uh, kind of unromantic uh, in a way of, of uh, you know, of a, a historian where you are just trying to um, make informed speculations uh, uh, and connections between various kinds of documents that exist, um, but relatively little of it in the kind of personal narrative vein, um, which would make a certain things much easier, uh, uh, I would imagine. Um, let me ask you um, briefly uh, about the, the public history part of this uh, project and your own work. Um, I had mentioned before that it would be it, it must be nice to be an academic and think that your work can have a direct impact. Um, and I do imagine that the Historical Society and others are planning to make use of what it is that you uncover uh, in how they present the information going forward. Um, how, how do you see that kind of thing playing out? Um, uh, you know, at, at, in what way um, do you hope for uh, this work to change that 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 narrative that gets passed on through the plaques, through the uh, written materials, through the tour guides, et cetera? Um, well, I, I think that it's will enable them to highlight um, stories that may have been missed before. Um, I, I will say that um, I think the Lexington Historical Society has um, done a good job in trying to present that at their um, historic sites. Um, and this project is a, an effort to improve on that and to deepen the knowledge that they have to share. So I, I would imagine it might lead to um, additional um, pamphlets. Um, it might um, add to some of the signage that's there. It definitely will be um, figure in the um, interpretations that are given at these sites um, and perhaps even um, on any tours of Lexington as a whole. Um, so hopefully it will help um, provide a fuller sense of, of Lexington. Um, I think you're right that because of its role in the um, War of Independence on April 19th and then afterwards as um, work of abolitionists and so forth, it took on this image um, that moved it away from the fact that, like all of the colonies, it had a slave beginning, um, a slave holding beginning. And so I think by bringing that in, it broadens the story and deepens our understanding of this issue and, and also raises um, the, the interesting um, juxtaposition of freedom and emancipation. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, let me, I think this is the last thing I, I'd like to ask you about today. Um, and that is who, who the audience for this is as far as you're concerned in your, again, your, your aspirations. And the reason I ask that is because to state an obvious fact, Lexington, like Arlington, like Concord, like many other Western suburbs of the in the Boston area, are is a primarily white community. Um, I don't have any idea of what the overall makeup of those who visit um, these sites is in, in terms of demographics, but I will say that we live in these majority white communities. Um, so. I am wondering whether your hopes are to primarily, well, I should just leave it at that. Who, who do you hope to be um, that this will resonate the most for the work that you do? Um, well, my hope would be that it will resonate with everyone um, as a public history really is trying to reach everyone because this is um, the history of our nation. Right. And this is central stuff. So hopefully for um, residents, it will um, be something that will inform both black and white residents. Hopefully um, there will be ways to 
connect with the school system to um, include this in curriculum. Um, but I also hope that um, for tourists who come through and visit, that it will connect with them. And hopefully, um, and, and those tourists I know come from all over, not only the country, but the world. And hopefully it will um, resonate with them and, or at least make them stop and think um, about this broader history and the complexities of this place we call America, you know. Um, so hopefully it will resonate um, in many different ways with those who come to Lexington because they, you know, are fans of the War of Independence. Hopefully it will resonate with them. Those who come out of curiosity, hopefully it will raise questions and resonate with them. Um, those who come because uh, they just are in Boston and someone told them they should see this historic sites, hopefully it will resonate with them as well. Well, I think you just mentioned the phrase, you know, at least it will make them, you know, one, one hopes it will make people stop and think. And what a great goal in and of itself um, for, for uh, to take on with a project like this is just, um, you know, at, at very minimum, getting people to uh, question what it is that they, they learned in a very kind of rote fashion, perhaps in a very long time ago, perhaps, and, and, and think, th think these things anew um, as a way to um, hopefully, you know, change the course uh, that we are on and uh, from an understanding of where we started um, that is more nuanced and more complex and more complete. Uh, than, than many of us have received up till now. Um, I want to thank you for taking the time today, uh, I really do, and for taking this on. Um, I wonder, is there any connection between the fact that you will be spending the balance of the coming year on this work and the fact that you're just uh, wrapping up your tenure at uh, Suffolk? Um, no, there was no intentionality on, you know, in either of those. It just happened that way. Just a happy, okay, happy coincidence. Fair enough. Um, well, um, we, I, I would be very, I would be delighted uh, to check in with you during the course of the work that you do, but I am sure that we will um, absolutely uh, be getting together um, when your, your work, so, so to speak, is complete um, and, um, and you, you can share with us what you've learned. Um, I look very forward to that. Um, so thanks again for the conversation today. I have been speaking with Professor Robert Bellinger from Suffolk University, who is uh, engaged in a project that we are all uh, going to be uh, the beneficiaries of. So um, with our thanks to the professor for his time today and our thanks to you for joining us, I am James Milan. This is ACMI's Public Affairs Programming, and we appreciate you being here. We'll see you next time.